So, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm Matt Brown. I'm kind of regular here. Um, I uh, work for Iowa Digital. I am the uh, VP of Operations and head of our uh, recommendation software development team. Um, my fancy new shirt, Scribbler. You can come talk to me if you want to. That's one of our new products we launched a couple weeks ago that no one really uses, but that's a <laughs> that issue. But uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk uh, about uh, a new practice we started at Iowa Digital. Hopefully we'll become more regular. Um, so uh, I had this idea that um, I, I kind of wanted to get our group to do some more, um, write some code and talk about what you do. So I looked online, tried to find an interesting, what I thought would be a relatively quick five to 10 minute sort of programming challenge. Hey, let's find a little puzzle uh, in our group of, of five of us, something we can do pretty quick and then and then uh, have people talk about it. Um, and so um, I did a little search in, turns out that Google uh, Code Jam, they have some pretty cool things that I thought were, were pretty quick. Um, and so I, I, without really much uh, forethought, I went, I, you know, I took their stuff, I created an email, you know, we kind of talked about it a little bit, I sent out an email, I said, okay, I'm gonna set the timer for five minutes and we're gonna go. Go whack whack whack. Two seconds later, the timer went off. No <laughs> one was done. Um, um, so we set the timer for a little longer, and, and we started on this on this uh, uh, trying to solve this challenge. I'll, I'll give it to you in a minute. Um, it turns out that it probably takes a little longer than five minutes. But but this is a, the, the interesting problem that I, I think we chose. Um, so the problem was. Um, you're in control of two robots. You have to, to program the machine and uh, there are a hundred buttons and the two robots have to push the buttons. So, and uh, you're given this sequence of, uh, of instructions that you have to tell the, the, the buttons, or tell the robots to click the buttons in a particular order. Um, and you get these uh, directions in a, a sequence of of bytes and you got the object is to determine the minimum amount of time you need in order to complete the task of pushing all the buttons. Um, so uh, I think next slide. So to explain the, the input, you get, you have two robots, orange and blue. So you get orange has to push button two and then blue has to push button one, then blue has to push button two and then orange has to push button four. Um, there's, I guess there's a couple <laughs> extra things. So the buttons are each um, one unit apart, um, and it takes one time unit for you to either move um, one space or press a button. Um, so the sequence you would you would go through if you had these two robots in order to, to um, complete this instruction set is both of the robots start at button one. Um, the orange robot, because he has O2, the first thing he has to do is move to button two so he can prepare to push it. Um, blue he's gonna ultimately push button one, but it's not his turn to push it yet, so he's just staying there. So then, orange, he's at two, so he pushes button two. Um, the other uh, condition, which was an uh, interesting little twist, is um, both robots can't push a button on the same turn. So blue has to stay around again before he can push the button, okay? So the next thing is, um, back to orange, it's his turn again. Orange is ultimately going to go to button number four, so he's going to do a little advanced work. He's going to move towards button three. Blue finally gets to push his button one. Um, orange moves to four again. Blue is going to move to button two. Orange is at, I apparently forgot step six. Um, <laughs> orange is staying at button four. Um, he can't push his button. It's not his turn to push it. It's Blue's turn, and then step six, Orange is going to push his button, and blue is going to stay where it was. So, in order to complete this sequence of, of instructions, the minimum number of turns you could do it would be six. So, the output from this particular instruction set is just six. So, you get a, a list of different instructions, and, and the idea is to, to determine the minimum amount of time required to press all the buttons in the right order. Um, and so, Google provided a couple. Um, files, a small and a large, so you could could um, run your inputs through your program, make sure you got them right. Um, they uh, the different files had some interesting different boundary conditions, like um, 
I know for me, for, uh, well, I'll, I'll go on. So um, it turns out we, we hacked away for a little while. Um, Nate, he's on our team. He's one of our great developers at Igo Digital. He uh, was the first to finish. I think he finished in somewhere 15 or 20-ish minutes, somewhere in there. 20, 25. So, uh, so he was the first to finish. Um, and then the next guy finished maybe another five or 10 minutes later. Um, I was probably another 10 minutes after that. Um, one of our guys quit and went back to doing real work. <laughs> and the other guy finished at about 45 or so. Um, and it turned out um, some interesting things came out um, by the way in which we solve these problems, which I think is the interesting thing here. Um, so solution number one, this is, this is actually Nate's code. Um, and so Nate's way to solve the problem was, oh, I forgot, this isn't Nate's code. This is someone on our team who solved right, it this way. Right. <laughs> this is when I'm writing it to write the code as fast as possible. Right. I have to give caveats because Nate's a little embarrassed of his code because it it's, wrote fast. But so he actually, he wrote a really cool version using fibers later that I forgot to include. but. Um, I'll, I'll put it on the GitHubs and you can see it. It's actually really elegant and, and uh, very nice. Nate nice. writes good code, so. But, um, so, ooh, it's light maybe? Right? Yeah, I think we're gonna have to go to lights. So, um, Nate, actually it turns out the first two people who, can you read that at all? Yes. So the first two people who um, were able to solve the problem, they, they worked as if it was an actual simulation with actual robots, and they were trying to move the robots. Um, and so this is, so the next three slides are, are kind of Nate's code. I'll, I'll kind of talk through it quick. So he's gonna um, he's gonna parse through. He's gonna get each line of the file. The file is a, a bunch of things. Ignore some of this, right? But for each line, he's gonna hey, I'm gonna go, go do one. Um, and one would be one instruction set. That O2 B1 B2 O4 for Nate. That's one. Um, for each of those, he's gonna initialize some stuff. Um, he's going to parse the line, and because Nate's cool, he puts in a default condition so he doesn't actually have to do work. Um, so this is the default condition he did. He's going to parse the line, and what that's going to, um, if you go to the next slide, that will show us. Well, first, he's going to parse the line, and he's going to faff about. So, um, so he parses the line, and he iterates through faffing about to, pu to, to, to click the buttons. And then when he's done, he's going to put out the number of ticks, into the, number, the amount of time. So. Um, the interesting code is in the next slide. So his parsing line is not really that interesting. He's just taking the bits and putting them together because there's a space between. This is just simple file processing. How do I get the crap together so I got the instructions grouped together so I can figure out how to do my stuff. Um, he ends up with an array of hashes which say uh, the color and the number to print. So faffing about is the interesting part, uh, the interesting part here. Um, and so what he does is he determines what the goal is. Um, so if back in Maine, he's, um, each one of his ticks, um, he's actually doing something. So he's going to move the robot in each one. So um, if the orange goal is not at his goal yet and his position is before the goal, he adds one. If it's um, past the goal, he subtracts one. Same thing with the blue. So he moves both of them. And, he continues to move unless they're at their goal. And then ultimately, um, where is success? So then he pops the next instruction off, and if, if next instruction, so this is essentially, if I'm at my goal, um, then I pop off the next instruction set. So he's actually working, so he's, you know, virtually moving the robot each time to its right place and pushing the buttons. So Nate took the, the uh, program very literally and he wrote you know, a simulator that moved the two robots um, and was actually was able to do it the quickest of any of us. Um, so next solution, uh, solution two, um, this is like the math nerd way. So our team kind of breaks out where we kind of have, um, there's two of us who are uh, have degrees in math and think um, sort of in a mathy kind of way, and Nate's very much more an engineer um, kind of way. Um, yeah, I think he did a great job of solving it, doing you know simulating what the problem asked. Um, and we kind of ended up breaking into two different ways. But uh, if you go to the next one, my, my solution was um, I'm not smart enough to move robots, um, and I'm kind of lazy. Um, so what I want to do is I just want to find the minimum amount of time. Um, and so I did it sort of a uh, uh, trying to think about it as an algorithm more so than as moving robots. 
And so I created a simple class um, to represent my boat, my robot. Um, and what I'm doing is I, I know um, from looking at a couple of the examples, I determined um, that the, the minimum amount of time it took to, to press my button um, for whichever robot I was, the minimum amount of time would be one unit longer than the last time Orange pressed a button, if I'm blue. So it's one unit longer than the other robot's last click is the minimum amount of time it would take. So I don't really need to actually do this moving stuff. Um, so if you go to the, the, so here what I'm doing, this is me kind of moving it around, but I'm moving in leaps and bounds. So I know what I want to do is I want to take my location and I just want to find the distance between where I'm at to where I want to go. Um, and I want to, I want to move instantaneously and then I got to add one to click the button to. So I'm like trying to short circuit the process without actually having to move the robot. I know I'm going to move, you know, the, the relative distance between where I'm at and where I need to go plus one for the button. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to have to sync up with the other robot. I need to know from the other robot, has he pushed his button? So if it's not his turn, uh, if you go to the, so the syncing is the, the, the kind of interesting thing. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so I, I'm doing the same thing, parsing file crap. Um, so I have each robot move if it needs to, and then they sync up. So uh, if you're the button whose turn it is, or if you're the robot whose turn it is to click the button, um, you actually make all of your movements at once and you click your button. And that gives you a, a number of ticks it took to do it. And then when it switches to the next robot, I look and see from where I'm at, how long would it take me to get where I'm at and press the button. And if that is less than how long it took the other robot, I'm just going to take his score and add one because that's ultimately what I would have done. Otherwise, I'll take my score. So like my solution wouldn't actually move any robots. Mine was just trying to find out um, what's the quickest way I can get all of the buttons pressed. Um, I have a next slide. No, that's just my stuff. So I, I just thought it was uh, kind of interesting that we had two groups in a you know pretty uh, constrained time um, crunch to come up with two really completely different solutions um, to the same problem. And uh, I thought I'd share it with you. What I thought was interesting is Matt and I joke all the time that we have to stop working together because we inevitably arrive at the same solution to every problem that we have. <laughs> Uh, and we ended up with the two solutions that were definitely the furthest apart. Yeah. So you can, uh, this code, at the, as well as Nate's actually cool code that uses fibers and, and uh, does it elegantly, he actually created a solution that would uh, uh, work for arbitrarily many robots. It's in here. Or, or Nate could show you. want to look at it. Um, yeah. Yeah, project boiler is another good <coughs> source of like you know. Yeah, maybe, I tried. To, maybe yeah. hours or maybe shorter. Time. Yeah, one of the guys on our team has a master's in math, so he has an unfair advantage. So I, <laughs> I'm well aware of project boiler and have done a number, but that's a significant unfair advantage. So it, it, that's great. It's got uh, some interesting uh, math problems as well as some interesting sort of computational challenges as well. Like you know, some of them are like you know, find the ten thousandth prime number, or different things like that. So um, I think Nate's going to show us his, his super cool uh, fiber-based uh, multi-robot simulation. Maybe. Oh, it's always the same thing. I always forget to push it. Yeah, so this thing, um, the same basically, you know, parsing code, is just keep track of which line you're on. Um, so for all the lines, uh, go create some robots. I got a Robotron class coming up later. Um, take the, the line format, turn that into instructions. Very boring line parsing stuff. And then for each pair of bots, um, go from the instructions you get and go find the next goal for that robot. Um, and as long as you have instructions left, uh, you're incrementing the step because you're about to do something. Um, you just call it go for each robot because they know where they're going. Uh, figure out which 
robot you're waiting on, which, which color button needs to be pressed next. Uh, and then if that one's done, pop an instruction and give that robot a new goal. So simulation-wise, it does exactly what the other code did, but it doesn't make me want to pull my hair out when I look at it a second time. Um, and then, you know, I'll put the answer. Um, so instructionize here, uh, pretty boring, slice things up. I did define a method on the array um, because it's Ruby and that just made it a little cleaner to read. Um, and then Robotron itself, you initialize, you create a fiber that says as long as I have a goal, um, if I'm at my goal, then indicate that I'm done. And if I'm not at my goal, then move me one step towards my goal. Um, spaceship will just return one or negative one, depending. Um, and then yield the fiber. You don't need to yield a, yield a value. You're just consuming one unit of time. And the rest of this is pretty obvious. You know, resume the fiber, check if you're done, set your next goal. So another simulation, but if you're wondering why fibers yeah, exist, yeah. it's so that you can write this code. <laughs> So the other solutions were similar to one. Yeah, the other. They, yeah, we fit in kind of two camps. Yeah, Justin's was more or less exactly like mine, and Kyle's is more or less exactly like Matt's. Very cool. So this is a weekly thing, you guys. Is it this mm -hmm. the first week? Well, we did it last week. We didn't do it this week for a number of reasons. We're gonna try it again next week. I think I'm gonna try and write the tests first. So we just kind of like threw it out there. I think it might be more fruitful if. Uh, you're given a set of tests to go implement, so we'll see how that goes. Cool. So and as always, I go digital is always looking for people, and you might get to come do cool stuff. With yeah. So do you think you guys arrive at the same solution because early on one of you kind of stays your general idea first, and the other one attacks it and kind of likes that point of view? Not not necessarily. More often than not, um, one of us will be presented with with a problem and we'll work out what he thinks the answer is. And then take the problem to the other person, and like the first thing that person says will be whatever it is that the other one thought of originally. Uh, it's right. possible that we're imparting a little bias, but we're both pretty careful not to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's just because a lot of, I mean, because it's the thing we sell, a lot of our problems are similar to other problems we've had. Yep. And so you know, we're, ways we're just so yeah. used to the solutions that that we've done. Are you doing this primarily to kind of educate your team just broadly on some other techniques that they might not have thought of? Or? Yeah, I think that's part of it. Um, I think part of it is like it's a it's a departure from like it's completely esoteric, right? There's not like some deadline or yeah. anything as hey, let's just kind of write something fun. Uh, I think a lot of times you, you don't get to write necessarily fun <laughs> stuff. You got to do the stuff that other people tell you. So. And I think we have a pretty uh, intellectually curious group, and so, yeah. What's Scribbler? <laughs> <laughs> Scribbler is uh, Igo Digital's new product, which is uh, meant to, uh, it's a product which allows uh, your organization to control their email signatures uh, and the format and presentation of email signatures uh, for a group. So. You could have an administrator who would sort up sort of the template that you would use um, for your group, and then you like go in and fill in your stuff, and it would make it pretty. Um, I have a new feature coming out where you could do things like um, I wanted to insert my latest blog, like the title of my latest blog, into my signature. Like, hey, read my cool stuff with a title, and it'll update the signature for you as time goes on. So. You guys use images? <laughs> yeah, there's really. Yeah. So you're saying every marketing department at every like medium-sized company has not already called you? Uh, they, I, we have a surprisingly large list of people who are are, are pretty interested. So okay. just gotta get it actually working. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> like so, most of it works. Yeah, there's some first. Yeah. Then you can add in the uh, set from my scribbler. Exactly. Yeah. There's a little thing in there, powered by scribbler, and uh, you can add in, you know, 
Facebook and Twitter and things and stuff like that. So, you know, if you want to show your last tweet or whatever, those sort of things are all features that are uh, in the works. So. So it's just text. It's not like links. Uh, so. Currently, you get a single image and a single link. Um, we have a plan to make it more complex. Um, but again, so for those of you who don't know, I, I kind of thought uh, probably ignorantly that you guys all follow me because I'm so great and I tweeted about <laughs> But, <laughs> but uh, so I go digital, what we did is um, we took two days. I feel like this is a I go digital commercial. Um, so I go digital took two days and we went to the speakeasy for two days, our whole company, so all 30 plus of us, and uh, we developed Scribbler in two days. Um, really, we went with the idea to solve this kind of problem of uh, corporate signature synchronization. Um, that's basically what we knew going in, um, and we developed the product, created marketing, um, created a website, did most of the product in two days. Um, and so um, from, from that, we're trying to figure out how in the guise of running our regular business, how do we keep this other thing up and going? But um, that's why features are kind of slow coming because I'd like do it in the evenings when I have spare time. So. Any other questions about Scribbler or other one? Yeah. <laughs> Let's build them all day. Thanks, man. Yeah.